Um, my name is Steve Culver, and my company is ISA Architectural. We are a manufacturer's rep firm. We represent 15 different architectural building products. Uh, seven of them are interior products, and eight of them are exterior products. I happen to have with me today two of my associates, uh, Mike Morehouse, who is our building envelope consultant. So he knows everything there is to know about the wall assembly. Um, and uh, so he'll be a great resource to you. And obviously, this program being about the rain screen system, he was very influential in helping, helping write this and um, has been a big uh, help in understanding what rain screens are and how they work and, and will further educate you. Also with me is Larry Windsor. Larry Windsor is our Vice President of Construction Services. So after you guys specify and put our products in your drawings, you want somebody who fights for that and keeps that in there, you know, in the spec, and then it ends up actually getting built with the stuff that you specified. Larry's the guy that does that for you guys. So he, he champions our products for you to make sure they stay, stay in the specification. So um, just real quick, a couple of things while to do a, a teeny commercial for my company so you know a little bit more about us. ISAarchitectural.com is a website. I encourage you to check it out. There's some great resources on there. From an interior perspective, everything we do focuses on walls and ceilings. So um, I know with all the educational work and um, cultural work that you guys do, some of these products would be very interesting to you. Um, for instance, we represent Gordon. Gordon manufactures all types of engineered metal ceiling systems with great acoustical properties. Um, some NRCs as high as 0.95, some really cool perforations and corrugations and different finishes. So Gordon metal ceilings and walls. Um, Ninewood. Ninewood is a wood ceiling product that we represent headquartered out in Oregon. They only manufacture wood ceilings. So what's cool about that is because of that, if you're involved in a wood ceiling project, these guys are typically more competitive than a lot of the competition because they only do wood. So they have great sources of wood. Um, just a couple other things. Dream walls, as much education work as you guys do. Dream walls is a back painted glass and marker board line. So great competitor to Claris. I hate to mention competitors like that, but um, these guys are an excellent competitor to that. So if you're specifying Claris mm -hmm. stuff out there, I encourage you to take a look at Dream Walls. And then just two other things, and I'll get started. Um, the one other one I, I think you guys ought to really uh, have an interest in is High Rock Acoustical Plaster with the amount of cultural type work that you guys do. If you're looking for that white seamless look, great product. They manufacture three different products, actually. A perforated gyp product, which is just simply perforated gyp board, perforated in 12 different uh, patterns. They uh, spray on acoustical product called Acoustimint that can be sprayed both interior and exterior. It will adhere to concrete. It will, there's a different formulations, but we'll adhere to concrete, we'll adhere to steel, we'll adhere to drywall. Um, and then lastly, their product, which is their real flagship product called Star Silent, which is a board product that will completely replace the gyp board. So you don't need a gyp board backer first and then the acoustical product. Comes in two different finishes. The rougher one is troweled on, the smoother one, or the rougher one is sprayed on, the smoother one is troweled on. So some really cool stuff there. And then the one last thing, and then I'm moving on, is Unicell Architectural, and this is a product that is an IGU. So this is an insulating glass unit that has these very unique louvers inside that IGU. Completely sealed in a clean room, so very hermetically uh, good and very sanitary. But what's really cool about it, and thinking about what you guys do, is this. And you know, not to sound like uh, an ambulance chaser, but unfortunately, this product, because it's an IGU with these louvers inside it, has really taken a huge uptick in the market in health or in uh, educational use. And the reason for that is we can build them with ballistic proof glass. 
we can make it so the louvers can go dark at the push of a button. So some really unique things you can do with that. So just one last thing to talk about. So any questions on anything, anything there? All right, cool. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the uh, AIA course here. There we go. So, today we're going to talk about rain screens, okay? Rain screen systems and their contribution to sustainability is the title of the course. Um, you will get one credit if you add your name to the uh, list, and if you uh, could please do that, I'd really appreciate it. And even if you don't have an AIA number, please put your name on the list so just I know who attended my presentation. And for you guys in uh, Tyson's in Charlottesville, Charlottesville you'll email Kendall, right? And then I'll get the uh, information. Correct. All right, great. Thank you. Um, here's what we're going to talk about. So we're going to take a look at the rain screen principle, what that is, where it came from, what the history of rain screens is. Um, then we'll take a look at how this rain screen principle contributes to the health, safety, and welfare of the people who are building the building, as well as the people who are going to be the future occupants of that building. So to look at the real details, we'll understand that rain screen principle in the history. We'll look at the different types of rain screen systems that are out there and understand why you would use one versus another. Um, then we'll take a look. We'll take this deeper than just what that rain screen is doing, and we'll look deeper into the wall assembly. So we'll start looking at water-resistive air barriers and different types of those, and again, why you would use one versus the other. We'll look at continuous insulation and thermal properties, ways where, or different types of continuous insulation that are out there, how you would attach that to your uh, design, and then we'll take a look at thermal breaks and um, what thermal bridging is and understand a little bit about that. And finally, we'll take a look at when we're designing a rain screen, we have to take a bunch of things into consideration. We have to look at sustainability, fire safety, moisture and air control, that thermal efficiency, and then the myriad of cladding options that are out there. Okay? So we have a lot to cover. I'll make sure that I uh, get you guys out on time, though. So first of all, the building enclosure is a, 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 what this whole rain screen is a portion of. And have any of you guys ever heard of any, you know, this ship, is there any way I can move that off of there? Does anyone know? So I can just drag it. And, ah, perfect. I didn't know if I had to have that up there. So have any of you guys ever heard of Dr. John Straub? RDH Building Science. Okay, I encourage you to check check out RDH Building Science on the internet. He and I we get nothing from him, but he is a guru about the wall assembly and how to construct that in different climates and different types of barriers. He came up with this concept of the perfect wall, which I'll show you a little bit about as we go further. But basically. Dr. Straub said, and this is not rocket science, but the building enclosure is what separates our interior climatized space from our exterior non-climatized space. Pretty simple, right? Well, because of that, that's where we have a lot of inefficiencies in our building designs. And really, where we really run into some of those um, inefficiencies is in those transitions between different portions of the building uh, envelope. So we have the roof system, okay? That's part of the enclosure. We have what we're going to talk about today, the above grade wall assembly. We have the foundation wall system, and then we have the base floor system. So when you guys are doing something, when you guys are drawing something, where is the most pro problematic area when you're looking at something like that? It's in what? Transitions. Transitions, exactly. So we do a great job designing unbelievable roof systems and unbelievable above grade wall systems. But where it's difficult is where we have the transition and we have to tie them together. 
So just keep that in mind. Um, we have this thing called loads. You know, and what do you guys think about? What's the first thing you think about when I say loads? Weight. Weight. Yup, gravity. How about lateral wind loads? Exactly. That's what we all think about. Um, but what's interesting about that is there's, you know, the basic definition of a load is any event or phenomenon that affects that enclosure, okay? There's all types of loads. And if you look at this, down here, I have, I have a line that I put in here. Below that line, we have all these things, sound, UV, ozone, what we just talked about, structural loads, gravity impacts abrasion, insects, animals, etc. The reason I put that line there is those things we do a great job controlling. They are relatively easy to control compared to the ones above that line. You know, as far as structural loads, not that difficult. We get our PE involved. He comes up with these loads, tells us what we need to do. Bam, done. Not that hard. These are difficult. Water, moisture, rain, vapor. Very difficult to control. We'll talk about why. Air, heat. Unbelievably hard to control. That's why ASHRAE came out with 90.1 back in 2007 and has revised it since. And that's why we're looking at exterior continuous insulation instead of just filling our walls with cavity insulation. And how about NFPA 285? That's not that easy to control, you know, and that standard's been around for years, but after the London fire in 2017, that really came into the spotlight. So those are the things that are very, very difficult to control. So real quick, just to kind of what we have done in the past, you know, when we first started building buildings thousands and thousands of years ago, we used traditional mass building products, you know, brick, rock, you know, the Egyptians made brick out of mud and straw. That was a mass building product. Worked very well, actually does some pretty cool things from a self-climatizing perspective, you know, those typically absorb moisture, sun drives moisture, vapor, and and uh, moisture in different directions, so they can still climatize the space inside. So kind of a, a neat building product. But what happened was we got into the Industrial Revolution, and we started to want to go higher in our construction. And mass building problems, products were somewhat problematic to go very high in. Now, you, you, and if you look about that, like the Egyptians went pretty high, right? when they built the pyramids, but how about the footprint of that pyramid to go high, okay? So we didn't have that luxury in urban areas in, and we wanted, when we wanted to go higher. So then we said, okay, we won't use mass building products. We'll, big, we'll use lighter products like wood, but the same thing happened. You had to go so wide to go tall, you lost all kinds of floor space, and you lost all kinds of usable space within that city. So what happened was, and in, by no stretch of the imagination did Corbusier invent this concept. He was just an early pioneer of saying, let's take the structure of the building and let's separate that from the walls of the building. So we build our structure and then we attach our walls. So he was a very early pioneer of that concept and that concept paved the way for the rain screen principle. We've done some changes in our wall assemblies over time. You know, um, we have the traditional wall assembly, which we all still have in all of our houses, you know, traditional cavity insulation in between the studs a vapor barrier on the outside and then some kind of cladding. Very simple construction used in residential work. Um, this perfect wall concept came out in the 90s by uh, Joe Seabrick and the other gentleman I mentioned, Dr. John Straub. And that was a concept that said, all right, when we're doing commercial construction using a metal stud wall, what happens is there's so much thermal bridging from metal attachment of our cladding back to our metal stud wall that we're losing so much effective R value from our insulation in that cavity that it's basically useless. 
So what he said was forget about putting the cavity insulation in there and just put continuous exterior in insulation, just wrap the building like a refrigerator, and you'll have much better thermal properties. <laughs> so that was his concept of the perfect wall. What do we do today? We actually do this for the most part. We do a, a hybrid where we still have cavity insulation, but we have continuous exterior insulation. And the reason we still keep the cavity insulation is twofold. One, if you look at this, you know, in commercial construction, that traditional wall doesn't meet ener energy codes in most climates. This can, this does. So we get a little bit of help from that cavity insulation. We don't get a ton, and I'll talk more about that later, but we get a little bit. The other cool thing we get from cavity insulation is we get great help from a sound attenuation perspective. So it makes our buildings much more quiet and uh, better from a from an acoustical perspective. So, uh, what is a rain screen? What do you guys think of when you think of a rain screen? What's it do? What was that again? It, it keeps the, most of the water out. What else does it do? Makes the wall breathe. That's right, makes the wall breathe and channels the water that gets in to get out. So that's exactly what it does. So here's a definition of it. An exterior wall detail where the wall cladding stands off of, from the moisture resistant surface of an air barrier that is applied to the sheathing. It creates a capillary break and allows for drainage and evaporation. So here's the gist of it. Um, in this picture, you see that we have this exterior cladding that is shedding the majority of the water. But what did we realize a long, long time ago? If we caulk the crap out of a building, what happens? Water still gets in. Because one, we can't caulk it perfectly. And two, caulk will 100% fail eventually. Okay? So water's going to get in there. So we said, you know what? Enough fighting this water thing. Let's do the best we can to deflect the majority of it. Let's allow what gets in there to drain out the bottom. And then let's allow air ventilation to go up through there to further diffuse that moisture. Okay? Where did this come from? The, this is interesting that Norway was such a big pioneer of this. They didn't know they were pioneering it, by the way. Um, they just basically had this concept. One, they realized that if they put their cladding directly up against the structure of their barns, okay, and didn't allow any ventilation, any open joint, that over time, the exterior cladding would rot where it was touching the structure, which would also cause the structure to rot, and then we built a new barn. Well, they said, well, wait, why don't we at least only put new cladding on the outside? So... They created a little space between that structure and the exterior cladding with something that wouldn't rot and allowed open joints in their exterior cladding to allow for further diffusion. So again, it was shedding the majority of the water and then <coughs> allowing diffusion to take place. They took this farther and first they did it with wood. Um, they coined it the open jointed barn technique, and then they actually took it to brick and other cementitious products because it's interesting. Remember I mentioned about mass walls and how they sort of self-climatize? I heard a, a very interesting um, word used to describe cementitious products the other day, actually like about a month ago, and it was somebody who turned them reservoir cladding because that's what they do. They, they suck in moisture and hold that moisture. You know, concrete, terracotta, fiber cement, they're all reservoir cladding. So we have to manage those a little bit differently than we do a single skin, you know, aluminum, painted aluminum panel. So anyway, that Norway was very uh, pioneering in that respect. In the U.S., here's the quick history. In 1950s, the Alcoa building in Pittsburgh First building ever built where it was termed a rain screen. NAMA focused on the rain screen principle in the 70s. 
Terracotta was used at 625 Townsend Street in uh, San Francisco was the first terracotta rain screen building. And by 2006, the IBC had adopted rain screen principle in 47 of 50 states and since then all of them. So here's the gist of what it does. It deflects, it drains, it diffuses, it dries. And I put designs up there because we used to kind of think that, you know, the ACM world was sort of the pioneer of rain screens in the United States. But there's so many designs now, and so every product out there can be made into a rain screen system. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's the different types of rain screen systems. So let's get deeper into it. So first we have back drain ventilated rain screen system. And I have this little example here, which I'll pass around. This is an ATM back drain ventilated rain screen system. It's open at the top. You can look right down through it when I pass it around. Um, so that air comes up from the bottom, exits at the top, it deflects the majority of the rain, and then if you look in here, you'll see drainage canals and weeps that allow water that gets in there to drain down through. Back drain ventilated rain screen systems are the most common type that is out there on the market today. Um, there is, and this is kind of interesting, there is AMA 509-09, which is a voluntary test to test a drain back ventilated rain screen system. You can do it and all it does, there's no pass fail, there's no nothing like that. It's just a test that shows you what percentage of the water that initially hit the surface of my rain screen made it the whole way to my water resistive air barrier. Okay? So it tells you what that percentage is. Okay? So feel free to pass that around. Now I'll talk about a pressure equalized rain screen system. Yes, go ahead. Does it tell you the percentage of water that got out of Everything that doesn't make it to that water resistive yeah, yeah. air barrier is either deflected completely as bulk water or makes it through the drainage canals and weeds. So really you can just subtract if 5% made it, 95 didn't get there. Now, there is no delineation between what actually got deflected and what made it in there and drained out. Okay? Good question, though. <laughs> what becomes the reservoir water at that point? Is there any delta in there? The water that gets preferred? Into the, into the WRV? There, it doesn't tell you anything other than what hits the surface of your WRV. So, take gallons coming in. Yep. Right? Yep. Some heads get protected, some get behind and go to your rain screen system. Yep. Whatever comes up. Is it all of it hundred percent or is it some that gets absorbed? Some that get some that's actually getting and get could get absorbed into your water resistive air barrier. Okay. So that's that and that's the gist of it. It's just telling you that percentage. Okay? Um so then we have a pressure equalized system. Now this this is a pressure equalized system. Um, this is actually something that is a little. I knew that was going to happen. I knew that was going to happen. That's what I was going to say. It's not together, but I'm showing you how it goes together. So just put that one there. I'll do it with two. Um, so the gist of this is there is less than 10% open area at the top. Okay, so we are closing the top per se. We still have to have at least 10% open to allow for airflow, but we're trying to seal off and keep any bulk water from entering the top for the most part. The other thing we do in a pressure equalized system is we actually will seal off and compartmentalize different areas of the facade because we want to try, and these are especially used in very high wind-driven rain areas such as South Florida. So on the western side of our facade in Miami, weather's all coming from the west, high winds, wind-driven rain. We want the pressure that's getting pushed against one side of the building to start pushing back as quickly as possible because we all know that Water is going to travel from high pressure to low pressure 
So if we don't get pushing back as quickly as possible, that water is going to find a way to get deeper into our building. So if we compartmentalize the system, pressure can equalize more quickly. So that's what we do in order to combat that and get so we're pushing back as much as they're push as the wind driven rain is pushing against us. If we leave the whole system as a drain back ventilated system and not compartmentalize, it takes too long for that whole facade to equalize the pressure and start pushing back so moisture has the potential to get deeper into our wall assembly. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So that's a pressure equalized system. Then there's one other type of system. Yep. Just talk to them about the testing. Ah, yes, the testing. There is a test for this one as well. Thank you, Mike. AMA 508-07, and this is interesting. So this is a voluntary test as well, but it only applies to pressure equalized systems. And the difference is that this is an actual pass-fail test. So what this says is it tells you what percentage of water is actually getting to your water resistive air barrier, but you will fail if more than 5% of the water that hits the outside of your rain screen system makes it that far, or you can also fail just if you have streaming water running down your WRB. So there's two reasons you can fail, streaming water or more than 5% of the overall water making it to your WRB. Okay? Any questions on that? Good? Okay. Then there's one other type. That's an open joint system. Open joint systems, obviously, there's, we're doing less of the bulk water deflection, okay, because we have an open joint now. But we have greater diffusion because we have open joints. So there's always a balancing act in what we're doing here with the rain screen system that we'll talk about before. Obviously, in an open joint system, just one thing we have to think about today is protecting our continuous insulation. And I only bring that up because especially if you're using mineral wool, for instance, in an open joint cladding situation, you know how when you wear a wool sweater outside on, you know, a nice dry day, it's, all, it's very warm, but when it gets wet, it's still warm, but it's not as warm. So we need to make sure that we can allow, we can protect our mineral wool because it's kind of like the wool sweater. So just need to make sure we use some sort of product to protect that. Good. So. Considerations of the rain screen. We have all these different things we need to think about when we're designing. We think about sustainability, fire safety, moisture and air control, thermal efficiency, and cladding types. So first of all, sustainability. We all know, we hear that all the time, right? You know, everybody, we talk about sustainability. What kind of words do you think of when I say sustainability? Environment, yep. How about a couple R words? Recycle, rapidly renewable is another one. Um, what color do you think of? Red. Not red. <laughs> Are you colorblind and you see your red is green? The G word. The G word, green, exactly. So basically, sustainability says it, it's a development that meets the needs of today without compromising the uh, ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's a fancy way of saying this. Don't design or build something today that will screw it up for the future. Okay? And by the way, you don't have to make it better for the future. You just can't screw it up. Okay? So, uh, pretty simple concept. There are three pillars of sustainability, and they, here's how they work together. There's environmental, social, and economic. If you take one leg of the stool out, Stool falls down, so you can't have sustainability if you don't support all three of them. Here's, here's how they apply to the rain screen. So environmental sustainability, here's the words we talked about before, you know, um, green and the environment and rapidly renewable. But the gist of this is, you know, we want to use products that are recyclable if we can. You know, metal rain screens, the 
terracottas and fiber cements, they're all recyclable. So some great products that are good uh, from a recycling perspective. Longer life cycle products are awesome to use. You know, zinc, 100-year building product. Terracotta, two, 300-year building product. So if you can use those longer lasting ones, they can really help. Designing correctly also helps. Um, if we use this rain screen principle and design them right, design it tight so we can keep as much moisture out as possible, but allowing that diffusion, we can do a lot from an environmental perspective as well. From an economic perspective, it basically just means let's use the right products for the job. You know, high density fiber cement versus low density fiber cement. We'll talk about the difference of that, but there's a huge difference in the amount of delamination that can take place in a low density fiber cement versus a high density. So if you're not using the right product for the job, if, if it's not framed correctly in that particular instance, it, you know, lower price does not necessarily mean it's the right thing. So just keep that into mind. Um, less maintenance is also very important. You know, if we design rain screen systems without cogs and sealants, which are going to fail, you know, we're, we don't have that maintenance where we have to come back and do things later. Understanding panel optimization is also key. Um, different types of cladding options have different panel sizes that work based on how things are manufactured. Social sustainability, don't design so that your cladding falls off the side of your building. Uh, <laughs> that is not being socially sustainable. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? That's in China, and that is fiber cement falling off the side of that building. Um, it obviously was not attached correctly, so we've got to make sure we take a look at that. So social sustainability as far as the whole rain screen system is, you know, make sure we're using the right things from a thermal perspective. If we're doing things that make our wall assembly more thermally efficient, that is being more socially sustainable. If we make sure we have a breathable facade so we don't have mold growing inside our wall and people getting sick, that is being more socially sustainable. We also have fire safety that we need to take into consideration as well with NFPA 285, which I'll talk about here. So NFPA 285, does everybody know what that is? Okay, I figured you probably did. The basic gist of it is it came about not because of that, it had existed a long time before that, but that brought it to the forefront of everybody's mind. And what it is, is it is an assembly test, okay? So I can't tell you that, I can't even say that this piece of mineral wool is NFPA 285 compliant, although every wall assembly with it in it is 285 compliant. Um, I can't say that this product is because I can only say that this product in a wall assembly consisting of this WRB, this girding, this continuous insulation, and this cladding can pass at that Okay? Um, it applies to types 1, 2, 3, and 4 construction and 40 feet or higher. So we got to think about that when we're designing. We have to think about this. The hardest thing that there is to control, which is water. I'm sure all you guys know Vitruvius from back in your uh, school days. Um, I don't believe, honestly, that Vitruvius is quoted as saying water is the bane of all buildings. However, he did allude to the fact that water was a nightmare to control. So uh, that's the, where uh, Vitruvius brought things in. And here's why. Water is a super interesting thing. You know, if you go back to your chemistry days and stuff and think about how it works, water is a really interesting uh, medium. And it goes, it does so many things. It travels in so many fashions. So we have that air pressure differential. Remember when I was talking about the pressure equalized rain screen system and how water wants to go from high pressure to low pressure? So that's what's happened there. So Water is going to try to take the path of least resistance and go to low pressure. So if we have all this pressure on one side of the building, water wants to go to the other side. So we need to control that. We need to understand that so we can control it. Then we have capillary suction. 
This is basically any time you get a pinhole in your facade, water is going to find some way to get in there. The smaller that pinhole is, the more pressure that gets generated, and therefore the farther that water can get into the system. So, need to think about that. We need to think about gravity, okay? Water flows downhill, so that's why we shingle, ship, laugh, do all that kind of stuff. We need to think about kinetic energy. You know how many directions a water molecule goes when it hits the surface? It's infinite. It's not even able to be calculated because it goes in every conceivable direction. So, when the water molecule hits here and the hole's up there, it could potentially go through that hole up there, okay? So, kinetic energy, way that water travels. And then finally, we have surface tension. Now, I know you love my picture here. Uh, <laughs> surface tension is interesting, too, because, you know, water flows downhill, we just said, gravity, right? Well, what does water do when it comes down the facade of a building and hits a soffit? It makes a 90-degree turn and hangs under the soffit. That's because of surface tension. So, it doesn't just fall off that vertical surface. It actually makes the turn and goes horizontal. So, that makes it even more difficult to control. So, very difficult thing to control. Moisture problems occur when wetting exceeds drying. We have a balancing act here. On the wetting side, this is what a rain screen is trying to do. One, it's controlling moisture of the bulk water. It's allowing for air transport of water. And then it's allowing for diffusion to happen to help dry. From a promotion side of drying, diffusion is paramount. So we can have wetting happen from diffusion, okay? because water can travel through air, but we can also have a ton of diffusion that takes place from the airflow in the system. So it's this big balancing act where we want to make sure we're doing everything we can from preventing wetting, but we want to promote drying as much as we can. So diffusion is essential for drying, and that's why it's so important to have great airflow and breathability in our walls. So, um, just looking at that and looking at breathability, breathability and vapor permeability and that kind of thing, I think it's just important to point out that we, whenever we're designing, if we put any kind of vapor barrier on the outside of our building, okay, which most building science today, by the way, has moved to we really want to have vapor permeability in our buildings, but there is still that area down south, you know, um, South Florida over through the Gulf Coast, where they still talk a lot about using vapor barriers as they're on their exterior. So if we use a vapor barrier on the outside, we need to be super careful that we don't put an unintended vapor barrier on the inside. For those of you who are my age, you may remember um, all the hotels that were built in the 60s and 70s, everything had vinyl wallpaper. And they didn't realize what they were doing. At, at that time, all construction was using a vapor barrier on the outside. And then they're putting a vapor barrier, vinyl wallpaper, on the inside, which created a great opportunity for moisture to get trapped in that wall and create mold growth. And yes? If we have the bathroom on the yep. other wall and mm -hmm. it's piling against it, will that be considered a vapor barrier at this point? No, because the mortar holding the tile between allows enough breathability <coughs> That it's not a vapor barrier. It's still vapor permeable though, so it's still allowing vapor to go through. Okay. Yep. Um, one thing that's interesting, I love to tell this story about about this unintended vapor barrier during Hurricane Katrina. When, they were, when FEMA was sending trailers down there for temporary housing, 
they had vapor barriers on the outside of all of these trailers, you know, uh, the exterior. They didn't realize that on the inside they were using a vapor impermeable paint as well. So then they send these trailers to this unbelievably humid area with tons of moisture, extra moisture because of Katrina. They had a major problem with mold growing in the walls of those trailers. Okay. So and they didn't know they were, they didn't know they were doing it. So just be cognizant of that. So no path for diffusion. So what are all these things? If I do on time here. Oh good. Um, WRBs, AVBs, VPABs, different acronyms we see out there. Just understand what they are and understand where to use them. Water resistant barriers air vapor barriers, vapor permeable air barriers. Um, water resistive barriers, we hear that term a lot, WRB. Um, typically they are mechanically attached and it's very, and, you know, a great example is Tyvek house wrap. Um, that is a WRB, a water resistive barrier. However, it is not necessarily an air barrier. Okay, so it's very important to understand it just because it's a water resistant barrier, it might not be an air barrier. Some products are, some aren't. So just something to be aware of. Um, air vapor barriers, I show this picture of a roof, and there's a reason for that. For the most part, we use air vapor barriers in roof construction. There's a reason for that. The reason is because of the way a roof is designed, typically at an angle, um, some slight angle to a degree, um, we don't want any moisture to get in there, so we allow all the moisture to drain off of the roof. Now, you might say, well, why wouldn't we use that in a vertical wall assembly? Well, the reason is because here we can protect it and we have enough slope, even if it's a very pretty flat roof with a teeny bit of slope to get the moisture off of there. In the wall assembly, stuff gets trapped in there. So that's why we typically don't use air vapor barriers anymore in our wall assemblies. Like I said, still used a lot in the south um, where there's a ton of rain, but that's kind of morphing and going more toward vapor permeability as well. We have vapor permeability that I just mentioned. There are two types of vapor permeable air, bar vapor permeable air barriers. There is fluid applied and fully adhered sheet applied. Um, you know, I have here's some fully adhered sheet applied examples that I can pass around. Um, has an adhesive on the back, gets stuck right to your sheathing. Awesome stuff because of two things. One, the adhesive is very strong so that even if you get a pinhole in this, the water can't go anywhere. The water gets trapped at that pinhole and it can't further permeate, you know, go underneath the adhesive because the adhesive is very strong. The other thing is these are very, very consistent. I'm going to get a very consistent perm rating out of this because I'm sticking it to my sheathing. The difference is in, in fluid applied, I am depending on my applicator to determine what my perm rating is going to be. So as he sprays the side of that sheathing, there's going to be peaks and valleys, so my perm rating is not as consistent. Right? Yes, go ahead. The other thing is that the sheet applied is not as number panel in terms of weather, like being conducive to certain weather patterns. So you can, you, you can be pretty, it's a little bit more reliable from a scheduling standpoint to go with the sheet applied versus the How does the sheet apply here at the top? That cost more? They're, they're very similar. Yeah. They're very, very, yeah. It's all said and done. Yeah. Actually, the, the uh, equipment they need for fuel is quite expensive. Most Some people, some general contractors will remove that scope from, let's say, the range print scope and just go to a waterproof. Um, and then they'll defer to whatever their setup is. They'll say I, whether I want to sheet apply. But again, then you're gambling consistency. Of the, uh, yeah. But as we've talked to these waterproofers, they're, they're basically saying we just go by square footage and plug in their, their, their rates. They
they don't care whether they, they Okay, any questions? Good. Okay. Location is still important, as I just mentioned numerous times. So just uh, there are still different design ideas based on the location where you're building and building. So let's look at continuous insulation real quick. Continuous insulation that we put on the exterior of our building. Here's the definition according to ASHRAE. Insulation that maintains continuity across all structure members without interruption of thermal bridges that are highly conductive and non-insulating except fasteners and service openings. I only point that out because I think it's good to know that when they came out with this definition, they really kind of excluded metal zegerts from really even being ASHRAE 90.1 compliant. They're still used a lot today, but they are highly conductive and non-insulating, so that is somewhat problematic for the, the use of a metal zeger. I think it's. A, I think they also should not have said, except for fasteners and service openings. And the reason is, how many of you today are designing buildings where effective R value is what we have to take into consideration instead of just nominal R value? See that, right? Exactly. Heck, New York City, everything being built there just about now is falling under codes that say you have to tell us what the effective R value of your wall assembly is going to be. So as that becomes more and more important, you have to take fasteners and service openings into account. And plus, you know, obviously we can't build buildings without them, without fasteners and service openings. So types of exterior insulation, we have polyiso, XPS, EPS, spray foam, and mineral wool. I'm sure you guys use some variation, use all of them, depending on whatever um, the situation is. Obviously, polyiso, you get the most bang for the inch, okay? Um, which also is interesting. We see tons of polyiso being used in urban areas where property lines and that space that, we're, that we talked about way earlier are in, you know, need to be taken into consideration. Although, the mineral oil market has exploded after the London fire, really, because it's the only one that is Definitely non-combustible. Okay. Here's a chart uh, which just kind of shows the the different uh, vapor permeability, R value per inch, what it is from a compliance perspective. Um, mineral wool is non-combustible and always in whatever assembly and FPA 2, 285 compliant. Polyiso can be, but it's got to be in the right assembly. Types of attachment systems, just good to know. Typical clip and rail system, using plastic isolators, not a bad system. Um, it'll retain sometimes close to 70, 80% of the R value of your insulation. Um, the problem is with that is there's a lot of parts and pieces to it. It's very cumbersome to install because of plastic isolators, plastic washers, metal washers, clips, that kind of thing. So. Um, FRP clips with through fasteners. This is a this is a, a an interesting concept that used a fiberglass reinforced polymer clip, okay, which should be thermally efficient, and drove a big metal stake through it, so made it inefficient. So uh, just something to keep in mind with that. But it is a system that's out there um, through insulation fasteners. We see this a lot, especially with rigid insulations like polyiso. Um, the problem with it is, with this system is there's a lot of blind fastening that goes on. So your poly shows up, and the contractor is going to try to hit the stud wall. Okay. Then when he gets extra holes, do you think he just spray from those things in right away? No, probably not. And so just keep that in mind. The other thing that happens on this is you get an edging out around the fastener. So over time, you start to lose more thermal. Uh, get more thermally inefficient through that egg out hole. Aluminum clip and rail, by far the most inefficient system that's out there. And the reason for this is because aluminum is still conductive. Um, aluminum is seven times more conductive than 
steel is and galvanized steel is. So because of that, it's very inefficient. Um, here's the most efficient way to do it is with some FRP full length girt that has no thermal, no metal throughput. So something like that will typically retain between 92 and 99 percent of the R value of your installation, including fasteners and surface. How's that So the way this is under the wall is here's an example of it. Um, it's got a metal flange that a metal insert in this flange on both faces, okay? So one face is going to go up against my stud wall or my sheathing and attach with a metal fastener through my sheathing back to my stud wall, okay? But the, then my continuous insulation is in the middle and then my cladding is going to attach to this outside flange. So there's no metal that ever makes it the whole way through the system, which is why it's so thermal. Just so happens it answers yes to all those questions on the left, and nothing else does. <laughs> so now let's look at cladding, and then I'll get you guys out of here. Um, very important to understand panel size limitations in cladding. Um, we want to maximize the yield. We want to understand those transition areas. We want to make sure we get the professionals involved, that get the manufacturers involved so we can help you lay things out correctly. We have all different types of, of exterior cladding options. We have ACM and MCM. You know, every car dealership in America today has ACM on the outside. So we all know what that looks like. It's perfectly flat. It's beautiful stuff. Um, it's pretty uh, easy to fabricate in the field. Um, very uniform colors, no sealants. The problems with it are there are definite panel size limitations that make it work from a cost perspective, and we can help you with that because we need to have one inch return leg, and coil sizes come in this, so there's a bunch of things we have to figure. So let us help you lay your panels out. Um, then we have the single skin metals, okay? So we have the painted aluminum, the core 10, the zinc, that kind of stuff. What's cool about these is these are all non-combustible. Some of the ACMs are, you know, the FR core ones are, but the PE core ones are not. They are combustible. So the single skins are always non-combustible. They're fewer parts and pieces. There's some really cool systems on, and simple systems on installing them. The problem with these are they require field measurement, whereas a lot of the fabrication of ACM and stuff doesn't require field measurement. We can get away with more fudge factor. And the other thing here is in single skin, they are progressively built. Okay, so we can't point excess a panel somewhere else in the system. All right, hold on. Yep. Just to clarify, can you go back? Yep. With ACM, there's, I'm sure you guys are familiar, there's essentially three different types of systems, which is the wet joint. A lot of people understand, you know, the, 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 it's a wet joint. Unfortunately, that be like a legacy of maintenance to clients, and it can streak down the panel. Um, that is a point accessible ACM system. Yep. Um, but again, you you got to repair it. If you, if you were to have to fix a panel, you'd have to re -talk. Um And then they have a the regular, typical, Back ventilated um, ACM system. Those those are progressively built as well, just like the, the single skin or plate uh, metal rain screens. Um, they're, they're progressively built, and if you were to have to remove one, you'd have to liquid weld one back in place. They have come out with some systems that have some of the manufacturers of ACM. They have a, a uh, point accessible. ACM system, so they have mechanical fasteners behind the splines that allow you to access it. So there is a dry joint for a dry joint. It doesn't need a car. Uh, it's not a wet joint. So you do have some options there. Um, and just as a correction, they even the FR core is combustible, but it will meet NFPA 285 um, if that's if you need to meet that. So okay. So. One thing that's cool about that, I'm passed around a couple panels of a single skin. It's kind of cool how those things, if you look at that, it actually blows your mind. That is one piece of metal. 
There are no welds. There's no other pieces put in there. It's one piece of metal folded like origami style into that panel. And I think that's really unique about those single skin things. Um, there's, here's another type of metal panel rain screen, which is this right here, which is a high definition printed extruded aluminum siding. It's really started to take off in the market because it's very, very durable. This isn't, you know, the aluminum siding I grew up with where you threw a tennis ball against it, dented it, and it was pretty much done. Uh, <laughs> this is really robust stuff, and you can print all different types of things on it, uh, wood grains and rock grains and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of a unique product. Um, we have all the cementitious, or as I called earlier, reservoir claddings. Hello. Um, terracotta, fiber cement, GFRC, brick, concrete, stucco, epis, the stuck at terracotta. Here's an example of terracotta. Um, terracotta is kind of cool stuff because it's unbelievably long lasting. We can do a lot from a finished perspective, glazes and textures and stuff like that. Feel free to pass that around if you want. If, um, if, it's a, if you hear uh, ceramic rain screen, that's basically the same thing as terracotta. Yeah. It's clay that's then uh, put under fire and yeah. made into a yeah. product. Yeah. So you might see some people, brand, some companies brand ourselves as a ceramics rain screen provider, some terracotta. Essentially the same thing, although some ceramics can be. Uh, Heated to a stronger, to create a stronger panel, so you don't need as a, as thick. Like a lot of terracotta, you'll see double wall, 40 mil panel. They do have some ceramics out there, looking back to the terracotta that are 20 mil, but they're different products. I mean, they're they're similar, but one stronger in terms. Of um, the great things about terracotta, non-combustible and this zero maintenance lifetime building product. It's unbelievable how long this stuff lasts and you never have to do anything from a maintenance perspective. The problems with it, very heavy and it's expensive. So um, sometimes terracotta weighs 40 pounds a square foot. So um, just need to take that into consideration. We have low and medium density fiber cement products. This is like your Nietzsche hot stuff, that kind of thing. Um, very low cost, easy to fabricate in the field. Um, the big things about it, the, the biggest problem with low and medium density fiber cement has to do with the possibility of delamination. Because what happens with it, the, way, the formulation of low and medium density fiber cement versus high density fiber cement is just a simple thing of a polyisobutyl sealant that bonds the Portland cement to the cellulose molecule, and that's what they do in high density fiber cement. They don't do that in low density fiber cement. They don't use this polyisobutyl sealant. So the bond is not as strong. So it allows, if water gets on, and it especially has, happens on the edges of low and medium density fiber cement, where water will start to delaminate it at the edge. And you also get that picture framing look. You've ever seen that where it lightens up around the edges? That's what's happening where water is getting in there. So just need to keep that in mind. Anytime you use this product, if you ever do, there are some height limitations. There you have, but the big thing is those edges need to be either sealed or relief cut or framed or something so that they don't leave delaminate, okay? In high density fiber cement, you don't have to do that because of that change in formulation and it's also finished under much higher pressure so it's much more dense, hence the name. Um, so you don't have to seal the edges. It is non-combustible. The, the, the drawback of high density has really to do with this. It's the biggest thing we hear is it is, it's very expensive to do hidden fasteners. So you typically have to have exposed fasteners, and some people don't like that in their design. Um, other cementitious options, um, well, actually here I meant to pass around. Here's, a, here's an example of uh, high density fiber cement. Um, pass that around. A couple different things you can take a look at. 
Then we have other products like GFRC. This is GFRC, glass fiber reinforced concrete. Um, feel free to pass that around. But the one thing that's cool about GFRC is you can do hidden fasteners with that. Okay? So that's why a lot of people like GFRC. Um, stucco and bricks, another option. We have phenolics. Phenolics are great because you can do any print, any color. You can do anything under the sun. They require absolutely no maintenance as well. Um, they are combustible, but they will meet NFPA 285 in certain situations in certain assemblies. Okay. Um, they also do have that problem as well with his hidden or fastener cost being very expensive. So typically people will say you can't do it. Then other options, thin stone and porcelain, Orion, and then there's even, you know, killed up walls and stuff today that are rain screen. So lots of stuff out there. So let's sum it up. Um, basically, there's, rain screens are the thing now. You know, that's what we do on the side of our buildings. Um, we put some sort of rain screen on there. It's critical to understand all the control layers. Make sure we understand our WRBs. Um, that's very important. So we don't have infiltration of water. It's our worst enemy in the building. Uh, make sure we take a look at what we're doing from a continuous insulation perspective and we attach it correctly to make things as thermally efficient as possible. Think about sustainability when we're selecting our different cladding systems. You know, longer maintenance. You know, for the kind of stuff you guys do, you know, K through 12, higher ed, cultural stuff. These are people that are keeping the building for a long time. So, you know, looking at longer term building products is a good thing to do there, especially. Optimizing panels to eliminate waste helps you guys save money, helps your clients save, save money, and make sure that you partner with uh, the right manufacturers and facade consultants so that we can help you with your design. So, there you have it. What are the questions? Just one other thing, if you guys want to stay behind have any questions about pricing, since Larry's here, we keep the running tab of basically all these different products and how they price out, not only from the material, but what we're seeing installed around town to all the general factors we can help do that. Yes. So they have a 15-year warranty, and here's the way the warranty works. It's a 15-year warranty that says you will have no more fading, you will have less than 30% fading of the printing in 15 years. So that's how their warranty works. And I, they, you know, I've actually seen examples of what 30% fading looks like, and it's not even really that noticeable. But that's the way the warranty works. So does it, it doesn't scratch off? No, it doesn't scratch off. The printing process is a very, uh, it's a it's a really interesting process on how it's done, how it's done that it keeps it from scratching. There are, scratch there are some manufacturers that do supplement, sublimation printing, which does, and that can, that can, can scratch. Yeah, because that's like essentially like, a, what they'll do is they'll, Color the plank, all one color, and then they'll. It's not like oh, a there's another. Tattoo. There's a, here you go. They'll peel and stick. They'll, they'll peel it off like whatever grain you want to achieve. That key consistency between the base color and that sublimated image definitely you picked off. Hey, Derek. What else? Anything? You good? Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Uh, to, to Just